fun. Um, Alex, it seems like you're here again. Are you going to tell us about uh, Hansel? Yes. Uh, Take it away, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, so just one thing before. Um, if you like the T-shirt, uh, please uh, tweet uh, for this girl. This is the artist that made the, desi the design. She's a local artist, a very friend of ours. And uh, she, does, she does a great job. And, well, if you liked it, please tweet about it. Okay, thank you. So, well, I'm, I'm Alex Savio. I'm one of the core, core organizers. Um, I'm a co-founder of the uh, Python San Sebastian Fund, uh, uh, Society, um, VIS. And um, I'm one of the EPS board members. I work in Munich in the Hesda Hospital. And I'm going to talk about a small module that I, I did for my work uh, last Christmas. It's called Hansel. And uh, I'm going to show a bit. Uh, so, um, yeah. So in my in my job, I uh, I usually work with uh, databases of files. Uh, so they are basically totally bal balanced uh, of, uh, tree of folders and files. So, um, for for example, in this case, I have uh, the subject ID. Uh, a subfolder called session, and then one f uh, type of file, and another folder uh, for another type of file, and then finally the the file. So to to parse all this, I I, I couldn't find something that would help me enough, and so I created I created um, some uh, Hansel, which um, which has a, an object called crumb, and it works like So here I define uh, well the the root the root of the of where this this tree this file tree is and then uh, next I put um, so I say here go the the subject IDs then the session and then the folder where the image files are and then actually the files so this is how I define the crumb and then. I can ask for the subject IDs available in the file system. Yes, and then I can, I have a list function. And, um, sorry. And uh, if I do list, I, I get a list of crumb objects, with each one with, a f uh, with one instance of, of the existing S SID. So for each one of these, I can I can ask for uh, I, it's a, a crumb file, and uh, so it's a crumb object, and I can ask for the specific oh the specific ID of each element, and I can uh, also uh, keep searching inside it. Um, and then also I can look, I can use uh, regex or file name matching. So for example, if I want only the subject IDs that finish with zero one, I can uh, do this. Uh, it has other functions like intersection to compare different, uh, so copies of the same file tree. Uh, I don't have the live demo prepared. Uh, and also it can copy crumb, uh, file trees uh, in the, with different structures. So using the same uh, argument names, I can copy different, different uh, parts of the tree somewhere else. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that uh, Alex is a very humble man and he might have skipped over that, so I'm just going to embarrass him a little bit here because I think he snuck away last year before we could do this. But Alex is actually the chairman of uh, the conference and he ran the conference here last year and he ran it this year. So we all owe him a huge debt of gratitude. I mean, to all the organizers, but especially Alex. So please show your appreciation.
Okay, I don't think he's actually going to kill me. <laughs> uh, so next we have Leave Your Camera at Home by Maximilian Saltz. After that, we'll have Lassa on growing an uh, open source community. Uh, Lassa, I think I saw your hair. Mind yourself. Uh, and then after that, we've got Pat Curry. Pat, are you here? Fantastic. Uh, hi, Pat. Uh, and uh, Armin, can I see you in the front row somewhere? Do, 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 do. There he is. Fantastic. Okay. So, uh, during this lightning talk session, as per tradition, we should have one incredibly long joke uh, split over into multiple parts. Uh, we should have one rap and one song. Now, we don't want to mess about too much, um, so I could probably try and combine the rap and the song uh, for you. Um, so, uh, let me just show you how the VGA adapters work, because that's got to be part of my job too. Which are your VGA or HDMI? VGA. Okay. So then we swap this one and plug it in there. And that should work a little better. Perfect. There you go. Are you ready to go? Yeah. Fantastic. Have a crack. To give a big hand, everyone. Okay, so my name is Max, and I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, two years ago, it was in the end of September, and I just finished my last exams in university, I decided I wanted to get out, go away from stress, and it was a Sunday afternoon, I had dinner with my parents, and I decided I wanted to go on a trekking trip to Sweden, in the middle of nowhere, not talk to another human person for like a week. So um, on Monday, I went to the outdoor shop we have in Hamburg, and on Tuesday, I got my ticket, and on Wednesday, I went on the train to Sweden, and uh, my first big adventure in Sweden started. So um, what you can see here is something like the first five minutes of the trip, and then it changes to something like this. You're in the middle of nowhere. Um, there's only peace around you, and I really enjoyed it, but I had this nice plan to do around 100 kilometers in a week, which is a lot if you're carrying around 20 kilograms of baggage with you. So um, the only thing that kind of felt civilized I took with me was a camera, and every time I saw a place I liked, I took out my camera and took a picture like this. So um, I came back with around 500 pictures or so. Probably half of it was garbage. You couldn't see anything on it because it was I don't know, shaky or anything. Um, but I noticed after the trip that every time I saw something I liked, I took a picture of it, and then I moved on because I had a lot of way in front of me. So um, I kind of felt like these tourists. You see, for example, in Paris, in front of the Eiffel Tower, and everyone is just taking a picture of the Eiffel Tower, and no one is actually looking at the Eiffel Tower. So... Um, this is what I saw all day, it's beautiful. And um, after I came back, I wondered why didn't I sit down for a moment and enjoy it, but only took out my camera and made a picture of it. So I decided uh, last year that I would do it again, and instead of taking a, pic uh, a camera, I would take a diary. I've never ever written a diary in my life, and it felt kind of strange doing it in the first two days. It was like talking to myself, and usually you're crazy if you do that. But then I remembered the last time I went to Sweden, I started to talk myself anyway after like two or three days of not talking to anyone. And I didn't really have discussions with myself. It was mostly swearing if there was a steep hill or I don't know. I just wanted to say bad words because no one could hear me scream them from the top of my lungs. Um, so what happened then was um, there's... Uh, lakes everywhere in Sweden where I was. So I discovered like a small current to uh, a lake that was not on my way, but I went there anyway because, well, maybe it was, it was nice. And I arrived at a lake that was beautiful. It was stunning. It was like on one of these photos you see on the internet. And I decided, well, you didn't want to do the thing you did last year. So why don't you just sit down here? And I sat down put my bag beside, like, uh, took off my shoes, and just stared into the 
void of Swedish nature. And it probably took me two hours to realize that I did that for two hours and didn't do anything else. So from that comes a very nice story because the first thing I noticed after like waking up from that was that I had dragonflies and bees sitting all over me. <laughs> and if you're at a rival like this, this was the view I had. And you look on your knees and on your arms and I think I had like two dragonflies and a whole lot of bees sitting on my hair and my arms. Um, you start to think about why are they there? And for me in that moment it was probably because of my smell. So I <laughs> thought about how, sh how will I smell or how do I smell for what has to be the king of dragonflies and bees. So bees like sweet things. So I had to smell kind of like honey. And the only thing I remember, remembered about dragonflies was that the dragonfly larva eats frog larva in ponds. So I probably smell like mud too, which is fitting after not showering for four days. So uh, the only thing that came out of that moment was the stupid thought, but I was happy. And I didn't take a picture of it. The only thing I did was writing the stupid story down in my diary. And um, the name of my talk is Leave Your Camera at Home because I think we should live in the moment a bit more and not think about how oh, I'm going to do 100 kilometers in Sweden, but instead of that going, I'm going to have a good time in Sweden, not do anything there. Just sit at a lake, becoming the king of dragonflies and bees, smelling like honey and mud. <laughs> because what else is there to life than that? And uh, in the end, I have a confession to make. These pictures are taken from uh, Unsplashed. These are not the t pictures I took on my first <laughs> trip. And that is just to make you realize um, this talk was good with pictures from different people, so why take your own? Instead, just like the moment, enjoy it. Thanks. next. Thanks very much, man. There you go. I'll just do a bit of fiddling. So what it is is this thing. Yeah. Either plugs in here for HDMI or here for VGA. Oh, okay. HDMI. 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 It is. Okay. <coughs> okay, I want that. I'm a very harsh lightning talk host, but sometimes uh, you can't quite bring yourself to end it on exactly five minutes, zero, zero, can you? <laughs> uh, Lasse, are you ready? Yes. Give Lasse a big hand, everyone. Thanks. I want to talk about growing an open source community and about being newcomer friendly because there are a lot of maintainers here and there are a lot of newcomers here. Let's bring them together. Um, uh, I'm talking about experiences we have made from the Koala community. So during those slides, you will see quotes from people that have done our newcomer process. They will hopefully support my arguments. However, this talk is not a Koala talk. So let's get started. I think one of the most important things to do if you want to attract newcomers is make newcomer issues. File issues, if you see a typo, File another one if you see another one. Don't fix it. And if you want to be even better, you try to build a kind of ladder, newcomers climb up. So try to categorize your issues in newcomer, difficulty low, difficulty medium, difficulty high. Let them uh, get to the next level. And that is something that people really liked and is really helpful. Um, of course, you need documentation. So ideally, you just make a documentation page pointing to your list of newcomer issues and maybe explaining something about your workflow. Then newcomers can learn about your workflow and get smoothly started. What I think is also very important is rewarding newcomers. So we have had some newcomers uh, contributing some really, really awesome bears for Koala, which means new code analysis. And what we did in those cases was we tweeted it out to our users because it's great, it is awesome, and you did an awesome job. We want them to know that and our users as well. Um, there's one thing about uh, responsiveness. When you have a community and you want it to grow, try to respond now. Whenever there's any question, 
drop everything you have right now, respond right now. The response can be, I don't have time up until next week, but respond now. Um, it is also very important uh, to know that code review, we have seen this in a lot of other talks as well, code review is a good way to exchange information. So you of course want to review the newcomer's code and you want to do it friendly. With newcomers, be especially carefully, make them aware that you're doing this to everyone, not to annoy him. But also, very, very soon, you'll want to have the newcomer review your code. Because in this way, you always get the fresh experience from the newcomer together with the like old but more seasoned experience from a senior developer. So you can get the best code and the best learning experience. That's a two-way street. So use it. Um, of course, if you have a channel, and you should have a channel, if you're low non code discussions, like make an off topic channel or something, that can greatly enhance the social aspect of being in such a community. I think the off topic channel is one of the most channels in the Koala community, almost as much used as the main channel, actually. And when a newcomer has Get, whilst getting started with your community, ask him for feedback. Because he has done the process and he will know way better what he needs in order to get started. So you can improve next time. At the same time, you show with this that you appreciate his opinion. And the last and most important thing, I think, is live the spirit you want the community to be. Because it is not an empty sentence that a lot of people say um, that a community or things that you do as a leader will be amplified. The way you raise a community, it will be. So very, very few words on how you can actually get newcomers to use your newly polished pipeline for newcomers. Participate in hackathons, summer of codes, make workshops for newcomers, and just enjoy them coming to you. Um, so I always end my talks with something you I want you to do. Maintainers, please try to do at least some of this for your project. Uh, the open space is, uh, was yesterday, sorry, I forgot to update the size. Um, and the newcomers ask for those things because maybe the maintainer just doesn't know about it yet. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope it helps. Thanks, Lassa. Up next, we have reverse. Uh, so we have uh, Pat Curry on this is my first time for everything. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, so listen, I, I gather that, and I haven't seen this directly, that on Twitter some people were saying that uh, maybe I was a little bit mean to uh, Florian after his, um, his presentation about the amazing Vim powered uh, uh, um, uh, browser. So I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, I'm a Vim user, and I think that idea is awesome. Uh, and second of all, like, if I was saying, uh, a project this niche and this crazy, if he can do it, anyone can do it. Uh, my message there really was um, one of, of ambition. Like, that is a niche project, but I want to, you know, that thing should really stimulate each and every one of us to go out and try things, and we're always surprised by the feedback we can get back from strangers and from the community out there. So really, for me, it was an inspirational story. That's really what I meant to emphasize. I'm sorry if, uh, if I gave the wrong impression, um, but please take the lesson that I did from that story, which is uh, Florian is amazing, we all can be amazing, and we should all go out and try these things that seem impossible, and we're so often surprised by how well they'll turn out. So forget applauding that. Uh, please applaud Patrick, who's come us to tell us about everything. Gracias. Este es mi primera vez hablando en español delante de una gran audiencia. Y gracias a la gente de Bilbao y los organizadores del EuroPython. This is also my first time um, speaking in English in front of such a large crowd. It's my first lightning talk. It's my first year of Python. A couple days ago was the first time I've ever been pickpocketed. This is my first time using reveal.js, and I am now working at my first web developer job at the Leibniz Zentrum for Marine Tropenocology <laughs> in Bremen, Germany. You know? Okay. And, uh, yeah. These are my contact uh, details. I'm going to be asking for help in a little bit. 
here's another first. So why did the monkey paint his balls red? To hide in a cherry tree. All right, hey, okay. All right. Yeah, I know, I know. So what's the loudest sound in the jungle? A giraffe eating cherries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the site that I'm working on and it's built on a uh, Django backend with a Postgres database and a leaflet JS maps background. And what I do is I call uh, using the request module uh, URL where I have a data set um, that I can project on here. So here's some dummy data sets. This is one. Um, this is Bienvenidos. Uh, here's another one. You can uh, call it and it hopefully will arrive. Ah, there it is. This is the ZMT that I work at in Bremen. And it's here. Anyways, it works. Um, and the idea is to create a place where people can put their mapping data sets and project them onto a map. This is the form that you would use to put everything on there. Um, and uh, then hopefully I'll be able to display everything onto a map like this. And I'm working on this project all alone. Um, and after watching Dugo Matthews and um, Dangor's Daniel Procidas and the koalas talks on um, reviewing code, I felt like I should ask for some help. So um, this is the Django model that I use. It's fairly simple and the most important is the URLs section right here. I'm going to be adding a uh, user model for authentication and stuff, but I call the URL to get the data into the, the site and um, from a, uh, the request and serializers and this is what that looks like. It's, it's kind of crazy and um, I'm pretty sure that there's a better way to do this but I don't know it. So I've come here to ask for everybody's help. Um, so we've been talking about code review. Um, if you guys have any suggestions, send me an email or um, you know, want to do some code review, go ahead and find the uh, GitHub account. Oh, and uh, um, I'll put that up in just a second. In response to Daniel Procida's um, frustration with the terms Rockstar and Ninja, I thought maybe we could be wizards. <laughs> maybe we could be electric wizards. <laughs> yes. <Anybody? laughs> Anyways, Dr. Shin. So, <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Uh, so, Armin, Armin, you're next. Uh, after Armin, we'll have uh, Pierre Gilba on Pi3 Stats. Pierre, are you here? HDMI. There you go. Fantastic. And then uh, after that, we've got Danny and Andreas on SHA 2017. Uh, and I know you're over there. Doo -doo -doo. Good. I, I should also say that when I joke about this year being Linux on the desktop, that I am a, a proud uh, Linux user uh, and I fight those issues all the time and I have the full Stockholm syndrome uh, that's engendered by that. Armin, are you ready to go? Yes. Give him a big hand, everyone. Thank you. Okay, so this is what a uh, very boring problem. You have a big application, big Python application, and this big Python application has a bug. Then, well, you're probably going to spend the next two weeks fighting this bug because it's hard to reproduce, etc., etc. So just for fun, here is one big application with a bug. Okay, so everything I'm going to show in this demo is on this huge application, but actually it works on a real large application. Okay? Can you see what the problem is? Okay, it's Python 2, yes. <laughs> Okay, so, well, obviously here the problem is that the, the, the list will contain one of the objects twice. And then this loop will add the value of this single object. It will add one twice. So that then this strange assertion here will fail. 
okay? And then, well, of course, if you run it, crash, you're not, and then you're not happy because, well, what crashes is this line here, okay? And then what can I do? I can, I can, I mean, it's, it's a bit pointless, but like, I could do that, but then what do I get from that? I get an object x, and x dot value is seven. Yes, thank you. <laughs> So what else can I do? You can actually start it using a special version of a Python interpreter. That is a special version of PyPy, actually, as it turns out. That, that does not really matter. And I say that I want to produce a log file. So now I've run my program, and it crashed, and it produced a log file of everything that this program did, okay? So what do I do with it then? I use an, another program on the log file. This is for color code lightning. And now I get a debugger. And this is called the reverse debugger because now I am at the first line and if I say continue, it goes up to the last executed line which is uh, os.exit in this case, and uh, we see that it's the uh, uh, 19th 888th executed line of code. Okay, that's boring. And then I can print my object and see that the value is wrong, like it's seven. But what I can also do is going backwards, step by step. So now I'm on that other line. Okay, but that's not the end of the story. Now, x dot value is seven, right? <laughs> yeah. So x is this object dollar zero. So I can actually print dollar zero dot value. That's just a strange syntax, but I can watch it. Now I'm watching dollar zero dot value and I can continue running backward. And now it stopped backward at the point where dollar zero dot value changed. This is the point where the value changed to six. And if I go again backward, this is the point further, further back where it changed to five. Okay? So it, so it means it's twice in the list LST1. If I print LST1, well, it's a big list. Okay, but I see that this big list is dollar two, so I can watch, I can see, I can count. Like, yes, it's really twice in this list. Why is it twice in this list? I'm going to watch this. Now I'm watching the fact that this value is two. Now I continue backward, and it's this line that's like before it was one, and after it's two. So this is the line that is your real bug. And now you've found the bug. Thank you, Amen. Uh, next, Pierre Gilbert. Gilba, where are you, Pierre? There you go. Thanks, Gil. Fine, so I'd like to do for you now uh, one of my favorite songs uh, and one of my party pieces. It's about a minute long. Uh, and it's a song, um, a famous rap, actually. Uh, I like to rap, by an outfit called uh, Salt and Pepper. And I'll do that probably just after the next speaker. Please give Pierre a big hand. Hello, so this is my first talk ever at the Leo Python, and it's about the Pi free status and next render. So, thank you. So, I'm sorry, but uh, it's very X11 centric, say Linux and stuff. But um, you are going to say why X render? Oh no, I don't want to hear about it. 
but I hope this makes you want to switch to a better window managing system. So why this talk? I was watching people trying to plug their computer yesterday, struggling so hard with their display, and I was like, why? This is 2016. It should not be that difficult. <laughs> exactly. So what is, is XRender? Uh, XRender R is a primitive command line interface to the Render R extension, and Render R extension is a kind of a communication protocol. And uh, XRender provides the ability to use that protocol and resize, rotate, and, and do things with the, your screens. Okay. So, what's i3WM? Uh, i3WM uh, is the, the best tiling window manager out there. <laughs> but, and uh, i3Status is a very small program that handles in a very efficient way the updating of the i3 bar. And um, by the way, I'm going to show you the i3 bar in the next minute, so be patient. But uh, also check out Qtile. It's uh, written in Python, and it's quite like i3. So, um, so what's i3 status? It's an extension of i3 status that's it's, uh, the, that handles the i3 bar, and it can do a lot of things. The coolest feature is for me is that it can handle click events. So I'm going to, to show you a, a live demo of it. So, oh, OK. I'm just, yes, I'm, I'm going to switch to clone mode, so up. And so now you can just uh, see what I'm seeing right now. So this is the i3 bar there, and this is the XRender R module of uh, Pi 3 status. And I can scroll and change mode and I can change also the, the sound and stuff like that. So this is on, on the, the left side, uh, the, the simple uh, configuration of XRender, and you can see that uh, I can say when I plug uh, my display port, it will uh, put the HDMI I1 on the, 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 the right, for, for instance. And uh, I, ca I can do that. I can, can shut down the, the screen. Oops. And I can, I can put the, the screen back on, but yeah, I, I can do I can, I can do that also. I can just say, oh, I don't want to be uh, on the screen, and then I plug it, and then when I plug it back on, oh, I have two, <laughs> and when I plug it back on, this this works. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm back to the slides now. And when this is the configuration, and um, I'm going to show you the GitHub now, but I hope you all like this right now. Amaze. And um, <laughs> yeah, so here is the, the GitHub. This is some uh, things about Pi Free Status on uh, Twitter, so if you want to, to share your impression or I'll see what people are talking about, saying about the um, Pi Free status. And please, you're all saying what I'm doing right now? <laughs> no? And please uh, have a look at the GitHub. Okay, that's it. Thank you. This is one of those songs that you start off thinking is really lame, and then you kind of like it in an ironic way, and then you realize one day that you just, uh, you just actually like it. Now I can bring home the bacon, fry it in the pan, never let you forget that you're a man, because I'm a W-O-M-A-N, that's what I am, doing what I can. The thing that makes me mad, crazy, upset, got to break my neck just to get my respect, go to work and get paid less than a man when I'm doing the same damn thing as he can, uh-uh. When I'm aggressive, then I'm a witch. When I got attitude, you call me a bitch. If we could be a weak sex fool, oh yeah, you a fool. Have you ever been in labor? I don't think so, no. I'm a genuine feminine female Thing. Can you hang? Ain't nothing but a sheep thing. <laughs> the 
Dan Shah, 2017, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Okay. We're going to talk about not really a conference, but a camp that is uh, next year, Shah 2017. We are um, actually not Danny and Andreas, but Witch Talk. That's me, and this is Bix. Hi. We're from uh, Hack42, which is a uh, Dutch hackerspace. Um, actually, the best hackerspace, Varnem. Also, the only hackerspace, Varnem. <laughs> so, this uh, Shah 2017, what is it? Well, the unofficial name is still Hacking Anyway. Um, you may or may not know that every four years there is a hacker camp in the Netherlands. Uh, three years ago, that was OM 2013. Uh, that was my first hacker camp. I think Bix has been to many more. One more. Uh, one more, okay. Anyway, um, so what is it? Uh, like I said, every four years, and every four years we think of another confusing name. Um, so, sorry? <laughs> um, it's actually a, a large, large campsite. We've got uh, a lot of big tents that are really way too hot. Um, we don't have any hotels or stuff like that. If you want to go there, you'll have to bring your own camping stuff. And um, there's, well, nerds, techies, um, programmers maybe even. People speak Python there. Um, there's people who talk Boolean over there. Um, really, every, everything like that, you know. Um, what can you find there? Well, open technology. Um, the most amazing tech, uh, the most amazing knowledge. Uh, we do little, little projects. What you see on this picture is actually a radio antenna, and the colors on there is a live working VU meter um, that was indicating uh, whether there was any broadcast at all, really. Um, so please, um, join us. Either come and um, help us organize or be a volunteer at the campsite. Uh, this is our URL. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we've got uh, Promoting Python as Student Community Mentoring Interns, interns by um, Bhargava. Are you here? Bar Gava, we'll skip that one for a minute. Fosdem, Stefan Viertel. After Stefan, uh, if, we can, if we can find the promoting Python Bar Gava person. Otherwise, uh, statistical data visualizations by Klaus Akinger. Klaus, are you here somewhere? Fantastic. So this boy has this dog, uh, and it's a very shaggy dog. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and all his friends are all constantly remarking on the, uh, the exceptional shagginess of this dog. And eventually his friends and family say, you know what, you should enter your dog in the, in the village shaggy dog competition to see who has the shaggiest dog. Um, so he thinks, okay, well, I'll give it a go. I mean, it's not, I mean, okay, well, how, could I really win? I'm not so sure. I'll tell you who can win is Stefan telling you about Fosdem. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, my name is not really important, but uh, I'm just Stefan. So, uh, it's just an announcement about one date, uh, the 4 and 5 February 2017 in Brussels, in Belgium, we will have the first day 2017, sorry. Uh, it's a just a small event where we can find some hackers, lecturers, and the rest. Yes, that's the description on the website, but in brief, it's just talk, hack, beer, talk, hack, and sometimes some beers, okay? The result, uh, some, we try to improve the free and open source software. Uh, in my case, just Python. Uh, we try also to improve the skill, my skill and the knowledge. So for the first them, it's just a small event with 5,000 5, uh, hackers, 400 lecturers, and of course, unlimited beers because we are in Belgium. So, yes, this event is totally free. 
Okay. For the next, we have some topics. You are you like Python's, but I think that you like some other topics. We can find LLVM, security, PostgreSQL, MySQL, virtualization with Xan, Docker, and the rest. Testing, IoT, configuration, uh, container, uh, Go, Ruby, and Perl. <laughs> so, but of course, there is a Python dev room. So, a small example. If you don't know uh, FOSDEM, it's just that. 1,000 people in the same room. 1,000. It's not the, mo the, the bigger room. So, welcome to Python for them 2017. The last year, we received 500 awesome panelists. Thank you. 16 lecturers and, of course, unlimited beers. That's the room of the Python for them. At the beginning, we received 80 people. The last year, with the success, we received 400 or 500 people in the same room. Thank you. It's all? Oh, sorry. So, Thank you, Stefan. Oh. There will be a dinner. <laughs> I'd just like to say that I've been to FOSDEM and I've been to Belgium just for it, uh, and it's not only beer that you can get in Belgium, and you don't have to drink beer, that's not compulsory. You can also get fries. <laughs> uh, fantastic. So, uh, Klaus, are you coming up and getting ready? After Klaus, we'll have um, Yernef Makovic, probably. Yeah. Uh, managing compliance and technical debt. What's the act? Pretty close, yeah, pretty close. <laughs> so surprise, surprise, he goes and actually wins this local shaggy dog competition. His dog is so shaggy that he wins the village shaggy dog competition, would you believe? Are you ready, Klaus? Yep. Let's give it a go. <laughs> So, hi, I'm Klaus. I do data analysis and scientific computing, and I want to quickly show you a library that really increased the quality of my working life. Visually exploring data sets is often a very tedious task, and this is where Seaborn comes in handy. So, Seaborn is a visualization library that is built on top of Matplotlib and also um, SciPy and Pandas. So, it's kind of standing on the shoulders of giants, and it offers a high level interface to to produce uh, statistical graphics. So it might be interesting because it has nice style functions, appealing color palettes, and you can do distribution plots, regression plots, categorical plots, and exit grid objects. So I'll give you a few examples, basically for a time series plot and a categorical plot. I have here a small data set where I have uh, categorical variables and wage, and we want to see how wage depends on these categorical variables. I hope it is okay if I continue because it's not very inclusive, our data set. They're only male, male participants, but <laughs> I hope it's okay. So let's see what we have. Um, I want to see how wage depends on education and race by means of box plots. For those who don't know what box plots are, it's basically a plot and a box. So here we have half of the data lies in this area. We have some robust statistical estimators, estimates, and here we have outliers, so there are some people earning quite a lot of money. And yeah, we said we want uh, to relate it to education, so let's add education to the x-axis. And we see here, it also, I, I think it al already looks quite fine, but the order is a bit uh, distorted, so let's, let's change the order here by adding the order keyword, and we see that it helps to have high education, but it is not really necessary, so you can already be a top earner, even if, uh, well, as a, a grad student, at least in this data set. And yeah, how about race? So let's include race. We could do this, of course, by adding a second plot, but it's hard to, to see the relationship. So it would be much nicer to first split uh, the data set according to education and then according to race. So let's do that. We have a, a hue variable, which is split up by race and now we have everything together. 
uh, over the education and also over race, then you might say, mm, okay, it's, it's a bit dense, so make it lighter, change the styling of the plot, and yeah, for example, like this, and I don't know whether you use the matplotlib, but I think five lines for this graphic, that's a good, that's quite good. So, uh, yeah, it's a fast way to produce uh, good looking overview graphics. So this was an example for a uh, categorical plot. Another thing that um, I have frequently is a uh, time series. So in this case, we'll take a look at, uh, at the sample data from a uh, European air quality database. In this case, it's a uh, nitrogen dioxide. So it looks like this. We have a, a daytime index and some variable, and we want to explore this variable. In this case, it's from Vienna, but I think it doesn't matter here. So what does it look like? For sake of simplicity, we restrict ourselves to the last year in the data set. We use uh, partial string indexing. That's quite nice, I think. It's part of a pandas feature. And yeah, this is how it looks like. So we know that uh, the cause for uh, nitrogen dioxide um, are, for example, cars. So since we know that uh, cars don't occur uh, uniformly over the day, it would be interesting to see how the concentration changes over time and also whether there is a difference between weekends and during the week. So let's add this information to the data set. I had a column whether that tells us is it weekend or not. Uh, we had another variable that is depicting the hour of day and another variable that we need for aggregation purposes. So we just add the information that we want to display in our plot to our data frame and then we just plot it. So it's like this. Maybe it's a bit uh, hard to read, so it would be nicer if you could aggregate, maybe using a median or so, some, some other robust estimator. Let's do this, and there we are. So we clearly see that during the weekend, the nitrogen dioxide concentration is much, much less. We have this typical peak in the morning hours caused by all the people who drive to work by car, and there we are. So we had just a few lines of code to add the information, and another three lines for the plot. For me, this is quite uh, useful, and maybe you want to check it out as well. I think my five minutes are over, so thank you. Thank you very much. We have a couple of announcements. Uh, Alexander here, can you see him, everyone? Stand up. Uh, we've just received notification that a talk is cancelled at the last minute. So if anybody would like to do an extra last minute talk, first come, first served, you have to find Alexander after the lightning talks end, because it's not fair, because otherwise just the front row will get to him first. <laughs> So first come, first serve, free talk slot tomorrow. Uh, the other announcement is that a Pokemon trainer, trainer by the name of, uh, well, so a Pokemon trainer has won the Pokemon Go Championship, and I'm here to announce their name. The name is A Throaty Mule. Are you in here? Maybe it's an anonymous thing. But anyway, the prize is a free ticket to the Cider House for this evening. Uh, so you'll be able to pick that up from the, uh, the registration text. Uh, congratulations, uh, the best Pokemon trainer, whatever that means. <laughs> and one final clap here for Janet, please. So, hi, guys. Um, I must confess I really liked all the lectures, but there were some um, that really somehow uh, resonated with me. Uh, I was really surprised uh, how many therapeutic sessions we had. You know, we talked about uh, how we write tests, um, how the upper management doesn't understand that we need to write tests, and we... Um, also discussed how to uh, make uh, pull request reviews um, as best as possible. And so all of this energy just to not fuck up things. And like an hour ago, we had a discussion. Um, it was a talk. Uh, what do we do when we fuck up things? Um, so um, in my day job, we deal um, a lot of the time with startups that have similar problems. 
And interestingly, it doesn't matter if they are very small, uh, if they are just uh, verifying the market, or if they just got like $10 million in their um, defunding round. And I just thought it would be interesting to share some of the uh, solutions that worked for us. So, um, yeah, again, the meta classes guy. Um, so, meta classes at the end of the day are really not that black magic. Um, and I will try to argue how they can actually um, help us in daily life to uh, resolve conflicts or uh, similar things. So, um, the first picture should basically make the whole point and because I don't have much time, I'll just skip it. I'll just make the case so you can then at home check what is actually going on. Um, okay, we have some code. So you see we have here two classes. The first is decorate uh, public methods and the second is require docs. So usually uh, the teams that don't have the time or the budget to write tests and yada yada, uh, they also probably don't have time or the budget or the resources or whatever to set up the CI pipelines and things like that. So um, the other option is, of course, to um, find some static analysis tools or linters and uh, configure them correctly. But if you have like a, a legacy project, you'll get uh, just noise. So uh, here are a couple of solutions. So um, the required docs class, um, you see it, there, it is a method here which indicates that it is somehow connected with meta classes. And now every um, class that will um, be subclassed from this one uh, will check uh, on initialization um, or better yet, whenever you start the app, so you get instant feedback, no waiting for the test or the CI server or whatever. Um, you just run it and uh, you'll get an exception if your method doesn't contain a uh, doc string. So how cool is that? Um, so if you want to go further, you can analyze the doc string and say, and write your uh, parser here and say, hey, uh, if this does doc string doesn't comply to let's say Google guidelines, uh, throw an exception. Um, and you can do a lot of cool things like that uh, just with uh, meta classes and again you get like instant feedback. You don't have to wait uh, for uh, Jenkins or whatever and it doesn't take a lot of resources. So uh, that was kind of the compliance part and towards the technical depth part. Um, so again, uh, I worked uh, with Selenium uh, for quite some time and you know, if you want to have the proper reports and so on, you have to configure a bunch of things. So a solution uh, would be to write a decorator that uh, catches an exception and makes uh, a screenshot and at that point. But in this case, you would have to decorate all of your test methods. Not very cool. Uh, just write uh, a class like this, a meta class, um, and use it in your uh, test class and from them, from there, if you subclass uh, that class, <laughs> uh, it just works. It, so if you uh, check out what's happening here, uh, it, it, you traverse through the uh, class uh, methods and you basically decorate them and you are doing that for all of them. Um, the other thing is, um, yeah, we didn't have time uh, for um, design and whatever excuse. And yeah, uh, basically you can refactor step by step and that's basically the same solution. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, 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 okay, yeah. So you have a class, it has some um, arguments and you can solve it like that with meta classes. And that's it, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, the crowd selfie, everyone. Stick your tongues out. <laughs> and that is, in fact, all we have time for today. So Thanks. thank you very much to each and every single one of the speakers. Thanks to each and every one of you.
Thanks to all the trainers, thanks to all the organizers, thanks to the volunteers, thanks to the bar staff in all the bars, thanks to the restaurant owners, thanks to the people who sell us ice cream on the street, thanks to the people who made the bridges and the museum and the arts and the, and the pigeons and the birds and the bees and the nature and the sky and the clouds and everything. <laughs> Where is Alexander? Alexander, regarding the talk.